I have the pleasure this morning to introduce our guest speaker. He's the lead campus minister for Campus Collective. It formerly was his house and is one of the missions that we here at Westwood help to support. He has been making efforts to reestablish our presence on the campus, which was curtailed during the pandemic, during which time almost all of our activities had ceased. He has moved here to Madison about one year ago with his wife, Kayla, and their four boys who are with us here also this morning. May I introduce to you Josh Didier. Not sure what that was. Can you hear me? <laughs> Is that going to be a little bit better? I think it was hitting the button on my shirt. <laughs> All right. Well, I am Josh Didier, and as was said, I moved here about a year ago. I actually served as an associate pastor in northeast Missouri in a little farming community before we came up here. And uh, I was told I have four hours to preach today. Is that about right? <laughs> we actually had a guest speaker when I was a pastor down there who he ran a mission that distributes Sunday school material and Bibles and other literature for teaching scripture all around the world, to play, specifically to places that have a hard time getting any kind of material like that. Um, often having to pray over containers, hoping that they make it through customs so that they can get material to villages and to local pastors who can help to distribute it. And he was coming to preach one day and he asked how long he had for the message. And I said, well, we usually preach for about 30 minutes. And he's like, oh, the message I give is usually about four hours long when I preach in Africa, so I guess I can shorten it up a bit. <laughs> and I said, well, if you go, I, said, I would hope you don't go four hours, but if you go a little over, I think people will forgive you. <laughs> so I won't go four hours today. You don't have to worry about that. This passage I chose for you today, as I often do when I'm coming to preach for just a single message, if I'm visiting in a church or even when I was serving as an associate pastor, there were times when I had kind of a message that needed to stand alone. Usually what I end up doing is going back to the time that I've spent in reading scripture with the Lord and go to a message that really stood out to me and that was on my heart and that I've been thinking about for the last several days and say, you know what, if this is on my heart, then maybe there's a reason. Maybe this is what I should focus on and preach. And I was reading through Mark and I came across this passage at the end of Mark chapter one. I'll read it for you today before I begin the rest of this message. Starting in verse 40 of Mark 1, it says, A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. And then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. As a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. Let's take a moment. I'd like to pray one more time before we go further into this passage. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for these words that you have given us. And today I pray that your voice would stand out more than mine. Lord, that what you have to say would be more important than what I have to say. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see your heart for the people of this world and to better understand what you have done for us. And I pray that you would work in each of our hearts today and use this message to send us out into the mission you have called us to. In your name I pray, amen. So the first thing I'd like to point out in this passage, the thing that really jumped out at me right away was that this man with leprosy had such great faith that his faith was not dependent on the outcome of his meeting Jesus. And I say that because when he came to Jesus, he's begging to be healed and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What I love about that is he comes in with this expectation that Jesus has the power to heal him. 
the only thing that was up for grabs is whether or not Jesus was willing to heal him in that moment. Now, I don't know if it was because he wrestled with doubt as to whether or not he was worthy to be healed. I don't know if it was just because of his position as a leper, thinking maybe Jesus would keep his distance and not want to come too close. There are all kinds of reasons he may have wondered why Jesus would have been willing. But each of us knows from our own experience that there are times we pray for healing, we pray for something to happen, and it doesn't seem to play out how we had hoped. And we're not always sure why, but many times in retrospect, we look back and we reflect and say, God had a plan in mind that I just didn't know yet. This man didn't know Jesus' plan, but he knew that was the only thing standing between his current condition and being healed. He doesn't seem to have one shred of doubt that Jesus was able to heal him. He just says, if you are willing, you can do this. You can heal this leprosy. Most likely, this man had been seeking healing his entire life, praying for healing, looking for an opportunity, and not finding anything. As a result, he's been isolated from society. Nobody wants to come close and touch him. Nobody wants him to come into their city and be near them. As a leper, it was like, you're infectious. We don't want you around. You need to go outside of the city. You need to go to a secluded place, and we don't want you to infect the rest of us. This man who has been isolated for most of his life, probably at this point, for a significant amount of time, he's been set outside of the community, sees, that, sees and hears what Jesus has done and is saying, this man, if anyone can heal me, it's him. I think it's amazing that he has faith without having met Jesus before. He is so convinced that Jesus can do this. And I bring this up because I wonder how often we come to Jesus hoping he is able, but not really believing that he is able to bring healing to the brokenness in our lives. Whether it's our physical ailments, whether it's as we come and pray for somebody who we know is struggling or for ourselves when we're struggling. Through depression, through isolation, through pain and suffering, how often do we pray with the faith knowing God absolutely has the power to do this. It's just a matter of whether it's a part of his plan right now. I think it's hard at times to have that kind of faith. I think sometimes we go in wondering if he's even able. And do we really approach him as this leper, coming to him broken in need of healing, pleading with him, saying, I know you can. And are we willing to also accept that if nothing happens, it's not because God isn't powerful enough, but only because it's not part of his plan in that moment. Maybe that's the hardest thing for us to realize, is that sometimes we come pleading, and if we don't get an answer from God, it doesn't mean he's unable. There's a, a storyline I really love through the series, The Chosen, that has, uh, that has been on for a couple of years now. And this man, and one of the disciples of Jesus, it's the, uh, one of the Jameses, they create this storyline, which we don't see in scripture, but I think it gives a great image of God's healing power that James is suffering from some sort of ailment. We don't even know what it is. We know he walks with a cane. He seems to be weak and struggling to move. And he's wrestling with the fact that Jesus is healing so many people but hasn't healed him yet and doesn't know why. And at some point, he has to be confronted by Jesus. He finally just opens up and says, like, I don't understand this. And Jesus begins to explain to him that right now, he said, imagine how wonderful it's going to be when you stand over someone and call on my power to heal them and they're healed. He begins to realize that even though he's not going to be healed right then, it's not because Jesus isn't able, it's not because Jesus doesn't care, but only because his plan is for something different right now. He knows that one day he will be fully healed, even if he has to wait until his new life in Jesus' kingdom. He begins to realize he doesn't have to have any doubt over whether or not Jesus can heal him or desires to heal him, but only has to realize that it wasn't part of the plan in that moment. This man comes to Jesus not knowing the plan. But what he knows is that Jesus can do it. One of the challenges I'd like to give for you today is as you pray, not to go in with fears and doubts over whether or not Jesus is able to bring healing in your life. Not to go in with doubts as to whether or not he can restore your loved ones. He surely is able 
We don't have to doubt that. We can come with faith like this leper saying, Lord, if it is a part of your plan right now, I know that you can do it and I trust in your power. I think the second thing that really stands out to me here is the response in Jesus. And I want to remind us that in this story, sometimes we make ourselves out to be kind of like the hero in the story. We think about how if we just act in Jesus' power, all of these great things will happen. And that's true. Jesus said it would happen. But I think it's important for us to often put ourselves in the position of the one in need. In this story, we are the ones who identify mostly with the leper as the ones who need Jesus, who need his power in our lives. And yet at the same time, we know that in following Jesus, we desire to be like him. We want to do the things that he has done. And he even told his disciples that after I leave, it will be better because you will do even greater things than what you had seen me do. God is going to do powerful things through our ministry, but I don't want us to get so caught up in making ourselves the heroes of the story who are going to go in and be the ones to administer God's uh, grace in someone's life, that we forget our own need. But even with that in mind, I think one thing we learn from the reaction of Jesus is his compassion. It says, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. One thing I want us to be aware of is the needs that we see in the lives of people around us. It's one thing that we're looking for on campus as we're trying to reestablish a presence on campus and meet students. Instead of just big events, putting on fun things, there are groups that are putting chalk down all over the sidewalk, letting everybody know that there's this big group meeting and they're gonna get together and play volleyball and they're gonna get together and play color dodgeball. I'm not even sure what that is, but it sounded like a messy game and they were gonna be playing it in the field outside of one of the buildings. And those things are great. But our focus right now in rebuilding a ministry presence has been on individuals and trying to connect with, connect one-on-one or in a small group with students to show them the love of Christ and the power he has in their life. Trusting that when Jesus makes an impact on their life, they're going to make an impact on another student's life who can make an impact on another student's life. There are lots of fun things we can do, and we'll do more and more of those things as our group grows because it's good to have fun together and experience that community. But at the beginning, our main focus is on individual lives and being present and showing concern and compassion for students to show them what Jesus shows this leprous man here. I also find it interesting, if you've noticed as we've read through this, all over Mark, especially in these first couple of chapters, we see Jesus calling on people to repent because the kingdom is near. He says that he has to go and preach in the towns because that's why he came, was to preach. He tells the paralyzed man in the story that immediately follows this at the beginning of chapter 2. He forgives his sins, and then to show that he had power to forgive sins, he heals him. And yet in this story with this leper, that's not even mentioned. Not because it's not significant, it's surrounded by that. The repentance and forgiveness part of the gospel is a huge part of this storyline in Mark. And yet in this man's story, it wasn't even mentioned. Maybe in some ways it's a given that this man had already trusted Jesus. He already believed he was the Messiah because he came in with such great faith. Maybe it's because the story at the end when he begins to tell everyone is a sign of the change that had happened in his own heart. And he realized Jesus is in fact the Messiah and he's told everybody. But the idea that he has repented and been forgiven actually isn't even mentioned in his story. What is shown is the way Jesus had compassion on his need in that moment. And I mention that because both sides of the gospel are important. Jesus came to bring restoration in the sense of our being forgiven and reunited with our God for all of eternity. And he also frequently brought restoration in the form of meeting a very personal, physical, spiritual, mental need in a person's life in that given moment. See, sometimes as believers, especially as churches, as as groups of believers, we tend to lean towards one or the other. We either get so far into we need to bring help socially to people that we forget about the good news of repentance and forgiveness through Jesus, or we get so caught up in the repentance and forgiveness side that we forget to actually help people in need. But Jesus did both. 
This story focuses more on a very physical need for this man. But both were very important. Both were significant. Both were very real needs in this man's life. But I think even more than the healing, we see Jesus meeting a greater need here. See, we all have physical needs. At times we've been needy and we need someone to come alongside of us. But what probably made the biggest impact in your life wasn't that somebody gave you a little bit of money or helped you with food or helped you with rent or brought you a meal because you lost a loved one. What probably made the biggest difference in your life was that person's actual presence in your life. The compassion and the companionship. I think that was the greatest need that Jesus met in this man's life. Obviously, being healed from leprosy was amazing. It was miraculous. But I think that that's significant, that the presence of Jesus here is significant because notice what it says. It says that he's healed and instantly the leprosy went away. But more time in this passage is actually... Sorry, I'm not sure what's doing that. More time in this passage is actually spent focusing on the relational connection between Jesus and this man and how he would connect with other people afterwards. Jesus, is, it says, is moved with compassion and reached out and touched him. Think again about how significant that is. Jesus reached out and touched a man who hasn't been touched since he was diagnosed with leprosy. Since it was found out, he's been pushed aside outside of the community and nobody wants anything to do with him. And let's face it, although we may not all face, face struggles with something as serious as leprosy, oftentimes our ailments, our struggles, feel like they isolate us from people. We feel like we're going through it alone. Even though we may know other people face the same struggles, often what's worse is that we feel like there's just no one to turn to. When we are alone in our struggles, that is when they become the most overbearing. That's when they're the most painful. To go through loss and feel like you're all alone. To go through illness and feel like there's just nobody who can help you or no one who cares. For this man, his isolation was probably more devastating than the disease he was facing. Because now he had to go through it all alone. I notice that you may notice too in the footnotes in your Bible, it may mention that some manuscripts say that instead of Jesus was moved with compassion, they moved with anger. And I was kind of fascinated by that, that some manuscripts would have a slightly different wording than others. But I think when you see that this man needed to be restored to people, to community, you begin to realize part of what might have made Jesus angry. Well, maybe some manuscripts would have highlighted that a little bit more than just his compassion on this man. Because to look and see, every time I take a step, it's doing it. I'm not sure what it is. Do you know? Okay. Oh, I think I found it. All right. Can you hear me now? All right, we'll go with that. I'll hit the power button on this one too, just to make sure it doesn't do anything else. Anyway, Jesus comes to this man in compassion for his need for community, for human connection. A man who has experienced no human connection for who knows how long. Jesus comes in and says, moves with compassion or even could be moved by anger. And I think that anger, I think the reason for seeing that in some manuscripts is because Jesus was frustrated and angry by the fact that this man has been pushed aside and isolated and forgotten and ignored. I think Jesus calls us to something important here. To notice those who are struggling. To see their hurt. And even though we may not be able to bring any healing power in their lives, maybe you can. Maybe you can come in and you can meet the need. Maybe you can come in and pray for them and the Lord is going to bring miraculous healing. But maybe the greater need is for you to be there for them. 
to care enough to come alongside of them. As we were preparing to move up here and we were speaking to people in our church in Missouri, I remember telling them that in a lot of ways, ministry feels like getting a front row seat to, do, to see God working in someone else's life. I think some of the most important moments I had weren't some great wisdom that I brought out from scripture and, and set before someone. It, weren't, it wasn't some miraculous work of the Holy Spirit to speak incredible words through me as I preached. It wasn't that I prayed over somebody and they were miraculously healed. It's that when they were going through pain and suffering, I was there. I was next to them to put an arm around them, to share in that moment with them, and to care about what they were going through. I think it's very telling early in Genesis. In chapter 2, verse 18, God creates all of these creatures. He creates man and he puts him in the garden. And then he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Over the years, I've thought more and more about that passage. And I think it's referring to a lot more than just marriage and giving him a wife. We are not intended to be alone. It wasn't just that Adam needed a companion to marry and have children. It was that his isolation and being alone was not going to be good for him, and God knew that from the beginning. Through this time of the pandemic, I think many of us have felt isolation in one way or another. I've realized how much we need people. I think it's one of the great struggles of our students now, as many of them have gone through the end of high school or the beginning of their college years with little connection with other people, feeling isolated and alone. We actually have good news that the university has been encouraging of campus ministries in these last couple of years, trying to create opportunities for students to get connected. And I think it's because even the leadership of the university, even those who aren't Christians are looking around and saying, these students need people in their lives. They need to get connected with groups who will support them and encourage them and guide them through this process in their lives. Jesus showed not only compassion by connecting with him, but I think it's amazing that when he's healed, he tells him the first thing that he is to do, he actually tells him not to speak, and we'll get to that in a moment. But he says, go to the priest, bring the sacrifice. He basically refers him to the Levitical law and says, go through this process with the priest to show that you have been healed. Now that ritual process, the sacrifice, all of these things were never prescribed as a means of healing. Even in the Old Testament, at the time it was given in Leviticus, it wasn't said, go and do this so that you can be healed. It was, once you have been healed, do this to prove that you have been healed so that you can be restored to society. See, Jesus didn't just come alongside of him in his need. He also paved the way for this man to be restored to other people and greater community. Because let's face it, we know that relationships may come and go. You can come alongside of somebody in their time of need and you can be there for them, but that doesn't mean that you will be there at every moment of need. Jesus paved the way for this man to experience ongoing community and restoration to society as a whole. And I think as we try to meet the needs of others in our community, as we see those who are brokenhearted, who are at a low point in their lives, it's important that we care not only about being there for them and alongside of them in that moment, but to introduce them to loving community that will continue to be for, there for them in the future. Because beyond just that moment, it's not good for them to be alone. Beyond just the moment of our need, it's not good for us to be isolated. We need community. We need people who care about us. And Jesus met that need in this man's life. He came alongside of him. He cared for him. He showed compassion. He touched him when he had been untouched. And then he gave him a pathway to be restored to the community at large. He gave him a way to experience real loving community in the future as well. I think the final point I want to make and where I got the title for this message is in these last few verses where it says, the man went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. Now, that was exactly the opposite of what Jesus had told him to do. And it's not very often that I feel like we go into scripture and feel like we can lift up something incredible that someone was doing when it went deliberately against the words that had been given to them by God. 
But in this case, that's what I'm going to do. Because I think Jesus knew right from the moment he told him, don't tell anybody, that there was no way that was going to happen. There was no way this guy was going to go back to the community, be restored, have his leprosy healed, and people come up to him and say, what happened? Be like, I just got better. I don't think there was any chance Jesus expected that this man was going to keep his mouth shut. And yet Jesus told him, don't go telling everybody, don't say a word to anyone, just go to the priest, go through the process of being confirmed as healed, bring your sacrifice. And instead it says, but the man just went and told everyone. It says that he proclaimed and spread the word to everyone what had happened. And as a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in secluded places, but people from everywhere kept coming to him. Jesus couldn't escape from crowds anymore because this man wouldn't do what Jesus told him to do. But one thing we talk about a lot in our ministry is that the good news shares easily. When something is really good news to us, we can't help but tell people about it. I love the story in Acts as well, when the apostles in chapter 4 are being confronted by the religious leaders who are telling them to stop preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. And their response, and I believe it's verse 20, is they say, you can decide for yourselves whether or not this is lawful. They said, you can decide whether you think we should tell people. But they said, we cannot help but speak of what we've seen and heard. They couldn't hold it in. The good news was uncontainable in their mind. What Jesus had done for them was so powerful. What he had done for all of us is so powerful that they had to tell everybody about it. And I love that for this man who's healed of his leprosy, it was exactly the same. He's no longer a leper anymore. And that was phenomenal news. To go and tell people, I was, I was diagnosed with leprosy. Nobody would touch me. And Jesus touched me. And now I'm healed and now I can tell you the story. See, all of us have experienced healing from Jesus in some way. Whether it's a moment as simple in our eyes as a moment of comfort. When he came alongside of us in loss and in weakness and in pain. Or if we were sick and broken and he literally healed us in a miraculous way. Or if we came alongside of somebody and saw the work, powerful work that he had done in their lives, we've seen God at work. We know of his forgiving power for those who repent. We know of his healing power for those who are broken and sick. We know of his power to lift somebody up out of poverty and depression and brokenness and restore them to society whole and remade. Yet sometimes I think we shrink back from really sharing the good news of what Jesus has done. It's almost like we're nervous to tell people because we don't think they'll believe it. Or we think that we're going to sound crazy if we talk about his miraculous healing. Or we think that if we talk about repentance and forgiveness, people are going to push us aside and be like, I don't know if I want that. I think I'm okay the way I am. And yet if we really believe that it's good news in our lives, that Jesus has healed us, he's transformed us, he's made us new, it should be something just we can't contain. That we can't help but share with everyone and anyone what he has done in our lives. I love that this man's first reaction, we don't even know if he went to the priest. It just says, Jesus said, go to the priest, go through this process, and it says, but he went and just told everybody. I wonder, it seems, if he even went to the priest at all. Did he even do what Jesus asked him to do? Or is the change here so abrupt because he just ignored what Jesus said, he was healed, and he went running into the city to tell everybody what had happened? I remember hearing a story. It was a study we had done that was led by Francis Chan with a small group in our church. And he told the story of one of his elders who became really quiet in one of their meetings and finally said, you know, we keep talking about reaching the lost and sharing the good news. And when I became a believer for the first time, I was really good at that. I couldn't help but tell everybody what had happened. And over time, I got more involved in the church. I got involved in ministries. I became a leader in the church. And little by little, I just told fewer and fewer people. And now I'm realizing I don't tell anybody. 
Sometimes we take for granted that we're, we're in a church and we serve in the church. And so we're doing our part to share the good news. And if we really think about it, we don't really tell anyone our story anymore. Maybe it's not even that we've stopped seeing it as good news. We've just kind of forgotten the wonder of what Jesus has done. The God who restores, the God who redeems us, the God who repairs our broken hearts and forgives us of all our sin. It's incredible news. It should be something we can't help but shout from the rooftops. I know when my boys were born, I always said I was disappointed when they don't let me go stand on the top of the hospital and hold them out like in Lion King and hold out my son and show everybody in the world. It's joyful news. We want to just share with everybody. And yet sometimes we forget how amazing this news is that Jesus came to rescue us, to redeem us, to restore us. My prayer for all of us is that we would have the same kind of joy in sharing what God has done as this man who was healed of his leprosy. That the good news would share easily because we just can't contain it. I love that when Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, he's talking about always being ready to give a defense for the reason for the hope that is in us. And sometimes we steer that to more of an apologetics. We have to be ready to have an argument for all of these difficult questions. But the more I looked at that passage, the more I realized he said, give a reason for the hope in you. Why do you have hope? Why has the gospel been re truly good news in your life? What kind of healing has Jesus brought in your life? How are you a different person now than you were before you met him? What are the, we don't always like to talk about it, but what are the sins that bogged you down but now have been forgiven and you are free because of Jesus? Where were you depressed and broken and aimless and now you have purpose and direction in life because of Jesus? See, when Peter's writing this, I don't think he's telling us that we all have to know the answers to every question. He's not saying we all have to be scholars. He's saying you have a story of how Jesus has healed you. Share your hope. Share that good news. Be a messenger of the good news in someone else's life to proclaim the great power that Jesus has shown to you and to others around you. Share those stories. Tell everybody. It's great to have a presentation of the gospel line by line. It's great to have opportunities to preach and to teach in Sunday school and to come up here and to read the word publicly. But you also have a story to tell of the powerful work that Jesus has done in you. In many ways, we're all like this leper. And I pray that today the Lord would revive that, that thrill in you of what he has done so that you would go and just share the good news of Jesus with everyone in your life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are a good and gracious God. Lord, I thank you that you are a healer, that you care for us, that you are compassionate. Lord, that you see the needs in our lives and you come close to us as a friend. Lord, I pray that our eyes would be open to see those needs in the lives of others around us. Lord, I pray that we would come close to others to be a friend when they are without friends. To be community for those who have been isolated from the community. Lord, I pray that we would care for meeting that need for human relationship and connection. I need that you recognize from the very beginning. Lord, I also pray that we would recognize the work that you have done in our lives so that we would share it with everyone. Lord, that you would revive our spirits, that we would look back on the transformation and the power you've had in our lives over the years, and that we would want to share that story with boldness, with joy. Lord, that we would share it like it is truly good news not with fear of how people are going to respond or whether or not they will understand, but Lord, just knowing that what you have done in our lives is incredible and we want everyone else to experience it as well. Lord, I pray that the good news in our lives, the good news of you as our King and Redeemer and Savior would be uncontainable. In your name I pray, amen.